Since the beginning of time, my friends and family have constantly questioned my life choices, often asking things such as, who invited him, and ew. 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 But the one thing they've questioned me most about in my entire life is why I still buy physical Blu-rays. When it comes to owning movies, a digital collection tends to be what most people have nowadays. Digital collections are easier to find, they take up less space, obviously, and streaming services like Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and Netflix have given you access to more content than ever before. But one thing that physical movies will always have over digital movies is the Blu-ray. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. This video isn't so much about beautiful Blu-ray art, that's a topic for another day. It's more about how many different companies have packaged their art in a creative way, or given the box some kind of really interesting and unique presentation. Some of the examples I'm going to be showing I bought entirely based off of the package design. Now there's more to it than that that we're going to be talking about, but this video will hopefully go to show what a strong presentation of a Blu-ray box can do. Before we get into what makes a Blu-ray box great, I want to discuss what makes one bad. Let's talk about stickers, quotes, and love. Lots of companies like to put stickers on their movie covers whenever they win awards or come with bonus features, but more often than not, these stickers tend to be really ugly and cover up the initial cool artwork that was there in the first place. And even worse than that, removing these stickers can be a gigantic pain, and if you do it incorrectly, you could leave marks or even damage the sleeve itself. Although I wish that companies would just stop putting these stickers on cases entirely, I understand that they can't do that. So I think a good compromise would be for them to put it on plastic wrap instead. The only thing worse than stickers is when an actual image that might as well be a sticker gets printed on the cover instead. You can't take these ones off, and they're usually much more uglier since they tend to be a company's logo. We can look at an egregious example, and kind of the right way to do it also, on the Parasite cover. The two items on the cover that we can look at that aren't so bad are the Palm Door logo and the quote. The quote, while it still takes up some space, isn't that distracting from the artwork and doesn't really pull focus towards itself. And also the font that they use really matches the entire theme of the artwork. If we look at the Palm Door, it's something very similar. They kept it incredibly tiny, used a black and white variant as to not pull focus, and they put it in a spot that doesn't really distract. Both these are great examples as to how to print imagery such as logos and quotes that isn't horrible. These work well because they're out of the way and they don't really distract from the artwork. On the other hand, we have this large, disgusting, bright, fully colored Rotten Tomatoes logo. It takes up such an odd space on the cover. The worst part about it is that's where there's supposed to be a focal point. The ball goes there, but instead, the Rotten Tomatoes logo takes up that spot. It's such an awful placement, and it's the exact opposite of what you want when you're putting some kind of logo printed right on your cover. It causes so much disruption in the artwork that it doesn't feel like a subtle inclusion, but more like a weird invasion, forcing the other elements of the photography to work around it. This is the exact opposite of what you want on your cover. Now that that's out of the way, let's really get into the dirt and start talking about sleeves. Sleeves have always been a bittersweet part of buying movies physically, because so often you find that they get damaged really easily, especially on the corners and on the edges. They also tend to be annoying to remove thanks to the hole that's put in for the barcode. Despite all those minor grievances I have with sleeves, they can still be really cool. A lot of designers will try and add some kind of different element that puts in a bit more interest in terms of presentation. Probably the most common but still effective effect is making certain areas on the sleeve elevated with a glossy finish. <laughs> This makes specific pieces of the artwork reflect in the light, and this can help to emphasize subtly or not so subtly something on the cover. You can see this in a cover like Three Billboards, where they barely elevated the main characters and the title text. But the shine of the gloss adds an extremely interesting sense of depth between those elements and the background. Another good example is Promare's cover, but unlike Three Billboards, this one has a ton of elevation. 
The characters on the cover are almost standing up like mountains because of how much there is. This really represents them in this over-the-top and bombastic style, which fits with the film's themes perfectly. Another cool element you can add to sleeves is holographic printing. Now most of the time when people think of holographic printing, the first thing that comes to mind tends to be Pokemon cards or Yu-Gi-Oh cards that your siblings wouldn't let you touch because you have grubby little kid hands. With Blu-rays, they usually just help make the sleeve extra shiny. Like we can see here with John Wick and Avengers Endgame, where they just bedazzled it to the absolute max. These elements may be simple, but they can still really elevate your cover to be extra special and even more interesting. Another element you can do with sleeves is lenticular printing. If you're like me, then you may not have known what lenticular printing was called, but you already knew what it was. So I took it upon myself to do some extensive research to find out what it was called. Pretty much, lenticular printing is what a lot of people accidentally call holographic effects, but it's actually something different entirely. Lenticular printing is usually used to add some minor 3D effects to art, but it can be brought to a much greater extreme with full-on image changes. Most of the time, I find complete image changes usually a little weird and poorly done, but a great example of this working well is the Shazam box art, since it fits with the main theme of the character changing ages perfectly. A tamer but equally potent example is the cover for Dragon Ball Super Broly. If you compare the regular cover and the lenticular cover, we can see that it has a much flashier and almost deep space sort of vibe to it. It creates a really cool depth and extravagance that isn't there on the standard version. One kind of big problem with lenticular printing is that it gets damaged easily by scratches, and these scratches stick out a lot when they happen. If you have a lenticular cover that you're particularly fond of, make sure that when you're displaying it or moving it, it's especially safe. One interesting sleeve I've seen is the sleeve for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which actually features two different covers. One cover being a simple photograph setup that showcases both of our main actors, and the other cover being a more stylized illustration slash painting that captures the tone of the film in a better light. I think this is a really cool concept, because if you're a retailer, you can use the more advertiser-friendly side, which would be more appealing to someone who's kind of just your average moviegoer. If you see Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt on the cover, you're gonna think, oh, I should buy that. But if you're an art nerd or a big fan of the film, I think you're gonna be much more satisfied with the illustrated side. It's a really nice compromise between having an advertiser-friendly sleeve and having a sleeve that has more artistic integrity. Next up, let's talk about sleeve transition. I don't know if there's an official term for what I'm about to describe, but sleeve transitions to me are when there's differences between the sleeve art and the case art. Sometimes it's as simple as just showcasing an alternative artwork, like with the Casablanca DVD. This is simple, but it works well. Other times this gets more creative, like with the Season 1 Stranger Things box. Not only is this sleeve designed really well to match the VHS era that this show takes place in, but when you remove the sleeve, you find out that the box that the discs are held in looks like a VHS tape itself. This is a prime example of creative and well-executed package design and sleeve transitioning. Another cool type of sleeve transition is when they add or change art on the case that coincides with the sleeve. This concept is used very well with the Spider-Verse cover. When you take off the sleeve, you're simultaneously taking off the masks of our spider heroes. The only weird thing about this is that for some reason Peter Parker Spider-Man doesn't get his mask taken off. It's kind of just an odd inconsistency. Another example of this is the Avatar The Last Airbender box set. It's a little bit more extreme than the Spider-Verse simple mask removal, but it's the same concept. We see Aang in the same pose, but he's no longer in the Avatar state, as if removing the sleeve deactivates the Avatar state and gives us a more closer, more personal look. Another cool little detail is that all the element symbols in the background of the sleeve art actually coincide with the positioning of our supporting characters and their own element. You could simply call these alternative artworks, but I think a lot of thought, skill, and effort went into making just the mundane task of removing the sleeve extra fun and memorable for the owners of these boxes. Now that you've stared at your Blu-ray box for 10 minutes like a crazy person, you can finally crack that sucker open and get onto the good stuff. The in- One of the first things I always notice when opening a Blu-ray is if it comes with a manual of any kind. Similar to how older game manuals would feature artwork and interesting information about the game, opening up a Blu-ray and finding something that isn't a digital code or a legal slash safety document is always super exciting for me. 
One of the coolest, most genuine experiences I've ever had from watching a movie is because of this Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind booklet that came with the Blu-ray. All it does is showcase some really simple screenshots from the movie and have these really short, simple statements from the creators. But that just made it such a heartfelt experience for me. Reading what the creators had to say beforehand added such a special layer to watching the film for me. And it's those feelings that it created that are the reason why I wish more companies would add these booklets like this. It may seem like an outdated concept, but it's something that has always made the movie watching experience so much more unique to me. Now, if you're not a crazy person like me, then you're probably not gonna be looking for a manual, but instead you're gonna be looking at the disc first. You know, I'm not gonna say that a simple disc doesn't get the job done because it almost always does. They don't have to be overcomplicated, but when you get a very creative disc design that not only fits to the circle shape of the disc, but also the aesthetic of the film, I can't help but get giddy over it. Good examples of this are the discs for Baby Driver and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Both of these taking the concepts that I just mentioned and really pushing it for their respective movies. One disc that I've only ever seen a viral image of, but I would be remiss not to mention, is the My Neighbor Totoro DVD. I can't confirm that it was actually packaged this way, and the Blu-ray that my sister owns of My Neighbor Totoro definitely isn't, but if there are versions out there that were made this way, then it's absolutely incredible. The idea to have the artwork of the characters reflecting onto the disc as if it's a pond is beyond genius. It captures the spirit of the movie perfectly, and encapsulates everything that I'm trying to say in this entire video. If it is real, this is movie packaging at its absolute peak. The final thing I want to talk about is reversible co- You used to be able to find reversible covers a lot more often on video game cases where they would either showcase a different character or show the same art but with no informational text on it or show new art entirely. When it comes to movies, it's almost always different artwork, but I found that some are much more effective than others when it comes to being reversible. Sometimes it's hard to tell if alternative artworks are meant to be reversed or not, but there's no harm in checking and that's usually what I do to see if one side looks better than the other. Two examples of fantastic reversible cover art is Phantom Thread and Your Name. Both these covers are beautifully stylized and absolutely gorgeous, and they're everything I look for in reversible artwork. In a way they remind me of book covers, usually displaying less information and some pretty sweet artwork that fits the film slash book, either thematically, symbolically, or just visually. However, some reversible covers don't work quite as well as those two. The worst example I can think of is definitely Isle of Dogs. The artwork is a good reference to the film, but there's no way you should ever reverse this. The wrap breaks up the image so much, making it almost unbearable to look at. It also doesn't work simply because the text is going vertically, and obviously you're not going to be holding your Blu-ray cases like this. Choosing to orient it this way seems like a bad decision overall. Even if you don't reverse the cover, the image is still laughable. The discs cover the artwork in the worst way, so even if you're peering through the back, you have these really weird cutoffs and points that just jut out. I definitely respect that they added this reversible artwork, but it's done in such a poor way that it's hard to appreciate the work that went into it. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind has some similar issues, but I think it's handled a bit better. Once again, it doesn't really work as a reversible cover since the wrap around the box breaks up the image in a really weird looking way. This one's not as horrible as the Isle of Dogs one, but it's not the best thing in the world either. When you don't reverse the cover, of course a lot of the artwork is obscured by the discs, but it still works really well having that background and landscape inside the case. My favorite reversible cover that I've ever seen has to be for Perfect Blue though. In line with the creator Satoshi Kon wanting to really mess with your head every step of the way through the film, they even managed to achieve this with the box. The imagery on the reversible cover is weird and jarring, and even though it does get broken up by the wrap, I think that it works in its favor, as the split face is creepier on either side. But it also works really well if you don't flip it. It's as if you're another dead fish in the tank and Mima's looking right in at you. It's an awesome way to reference the movie and it captures the tone of the film in an extremely clever way that utilizes the box to really push this fish tank concept. I understand that not everyone cares what their movie box is going to look like, and that's totally fine. But I think that a lot of thought and effort goes into these creative 
pieces of art, such as the sleeves and the discs, and I don't think they get enough credit sometimes. I think that when that extra work is put in to make sure that the packaging of the movie is extra good, that it increases the quality of the film. Thanks for listening to me ramble about Blu-ray boxes for a long time. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, let me know in the comments. And if you want to stick around to see what I make in the future, feel free to. Thanks for watching.